All right, in the last episode, we looked at what gives a legal regime its ostensible authority and the types of legal authority identified by Max Weber. Legal authority was represented by Lloyd in his work, The Idea of Law, as the Mesopotamian god Anu. In this episode, we will look at how violence can be used to make a legal system function. Coercion takes the form of the Mesopotamian storm god Enlil. It is one thing to have the unquestioned authority to make laws, but quite another to impose your will. The storm represents coercion. Or it can be represented by one of Zeus's thunderbolts, or by the police, who show up in the park to tell you it is illegal to sit on a park bench by order of the chief health officer, that you are breaking the law by doing so and will be arrested if you don't move on. But is force an essential element of law or something extraneous to it? I mean, we've already considered that the law may not need force at all, if everyone respects it and fears the source of authority in the form of the king or parliament or the globalist elite or the oracles who know what's best for you. So is force part of the law at all? Or is force something external that exists only when the authority of the law has failed? On the other hand, is force actually at the heart, the very essence of law, without which it is merely preachy morality? First, let's consider societies where there is domination without any belief on the part of the subjects in the legitimacy of the authority. But before that, let's establish what we are not talking about. This has nothing to do with a regime that has laws that are nice, fair and equitable. A society like Sparta, for example, is not a society without legitimacy, even if it had state slaves called helots, bound to the soil and assigned to individual Spartans to till their holdings. Helots had few rights and were subject to the Spartan secret police. The Cryptea patrolled the Laconian countryside and put to death any supposedly dangerous helots. But even so, the helots did not question that their masters were operating under lawful authority. It wasn't a good deal for the Helots, but it was the deal. Likewise, ancient Rome had an enormous population of slaves, which if you add in freedmen, slaves who were given or bought their freedom, far exceeded the population of free citizens. And yet, not even the slaves would doubt the legitimacy of the Roman state. It wasn't great to be a slave, but the state to which you were subjected was legitimate, without question. Modern Christians may dispute this, but ancient Christians did not. Jesus said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, which reflects a coexisting dual obligation, including recognizing the Roman Empire as legitimate authority on earth. Woke, or social justice types, may also object that such societies cannot be legitimate because of woke's particular taboos, for example, slavery but woke would be wrong. So, where can we find a society that dominates but has no authority? In Lloyd's work, The Idea of Law, considerable time is spent using the mid-20th century German regime as an example of domination without lawful authority. This, I think, reflects the times. There's one thing the National Socialists possessed. It was legitimacy, as they were avid students of positivism and kept the nation's lawyers busy drafting laws to reflect policy. Literally everything the German government did from 1933 to 1945 was in quote, legal. It's all perfectly legal, I assure you, sir. The government was careful to operate on the basis of the legal transfer of legislative power from the assembly to the executive, which was time limited and had in fact to be extended multiple times until 1943 when the delegation of power was made indeterminate, ending only in surrender. Lloyd speculates that given time and victory in World War II, the National Socialists may have achieved legitimacy in occupied territories. But I think this post-war need to look to World War II for examples of illegitimate authority is unhelpful to us today. What you had then were wars with armies moving back and forth, and this tells us very little about legitimate authority. This is the chaos of war in which the population holds its breath and is in fact waiting for the chess match to end, to learn which authority will prevail. We in 2022 have far better examples of illegitimate authority in the form of the dictates to national governments provided by the World Economic Forum, the International Monetary Fund, the World Health Organization, and countless NGOs. 
national elections are run on this or that policy, but when the votes are counted and the victor announced, national populations hear, often for the first time, of the implementation of policies that have been dictated by these extra-national organizations that were never mentioned during the campaign. We only need to look to the UK and the process by which Rishi Sunak became unelected PM and then the policies he has implemented since assuming power, which were never discussed during the leadership campaign. For example, to remedy climate change, to achieve equity in various forms, and move lockstep with other similar governments. The flip side is where the victor of a democratic process, let's put democratic in quotes, then abandons the policies that were promised to the electorate with little pretext required. To quote from The Guardian on November 2nd, 2022, Rishi Sunak is set to ditch his flagship conservative leadership campaign pledges. As number 10 admitted, there would be a review to assess whether they were still, in quotes, deliverable as a result of the worsening economic backdrop. It means Sunak is likely to abandon key promises on immigration in a week when both the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary have come under criticism for dangerous overcrowding at an immigration centre. In Canada, massive confiscations of property and the suspension of civil liberties occur without debate in the form of executive decrees, with little comment, if not enthusiastic approval, from the intelligentsia. For example, adding millions of Canadians to no-fly lists or imposing travel bans for the sake of vague notions of, in quotes, public health, or banning thousands of firearms lawfully possessed and lawfully acquired. In the case of handguns, again, without debate, the government announced the nullification of the right to transfer handguns by gift, sale, or will, creating a kind of life interest, a kind of caste system, with some citizens having a right to own and use, while others do not and never will have. The methodology of the handgun ban in Canada is both insidious, but also very informative in terms of what the future holds. This was a brilliant example of what the total state can do to make your property essentially worthless. As I will discuss below, it shows how the modern state can minimize the requirement of overt coercion while enforcing its laws. In the case of property rights, the ban on transfers guts a property right because the right to alienate, as we lawyers call it, is an essential characteristic of property, namely being able to use it as you like. Effectively, this confiscates property without needing to send a police officer to your house to take it away, physically. Gun owners are not a community that is going to get much sympathy. In the society where most people don't hunt and get their food in the grocery store, gun owners or hunters are a privileged class. But I'm afraid this has blinded people to what is coming. One can see in the handgun freeze, in the method used, that confiscation can, perhaps will, be used by a power to ossify the use of other forms of property in the same way. Property the state considers obnoxious, such as gas-powered cars. Could you imagine that? Where you're not allowed to sell, gift it, will it? Uh, what about detached housing, rural land, and other forms of property needed to be done away with and bulldozed, figuratively or in fact, to make room for their new utopian society. This isn't hard to imagine when we are told that someday we will own nothing and be happy. Such a tool in the hands of a power that dominates without legitimacy is obviously more of a concern. If domination can exist without lawful authority, does that mean we can skip an inquiry into legal authority altogether? Is all that really matters power? Does this mean that Thrasymachus was correct, as he argued in Plato's Republic concerning justice, that it is simply the rule of the stronger? Is it true that law is nothing more than the rules and prohibitions that the most powerful can impose? This would mean that any occupying foreign power is legitimate because it's powerful. And rules imposed by gangsters and terrorist organizations in a neighborhood or region are lawful simply because they can be enforced with violence. This is too superficial an understanding of what law is, obviously. On the other hand, can law really exist in a practical sense if it can't be backed by force? The police, the prison guard, the asylum for the criminally insane, the executioner, when we had such folks, are familiar apparatuses of almost every legal system. 
There is a famous English legal dictum that the best test for whether a person is legally insane is if he would have done the deed if a policeman were at his elbow. Of course, that would mean most of the people robbing and looting during the BLM riots or during the desecration of statues in the last few years, with the police twiddling their thumbs, should be classified as insane. It is certainly arguable whether the woke and social justice phenomenon or the passive response to the lockdowns are indeed forms of insanity or mental illness or personality disorder, legal or not. Another way of looking at it, if the police are standing aside while laws are broken, is whether that means we are no longer living in a legal system at all, or rather living in a system that can be periodically suspended at the discretion of the state and its agents. Selective anarchy. This again is too technical. Uh, selective anarchy in this example is better understood as a characteristic of a particular type of state, the anarcho-terrorist one, rather than being separate from it. Some argue that law which depends on force alone offends the principles of true morality. However, this simply collapses law into what the individual or subgroup regards as moral. We have already seen that law and morality are not the same thing, although they often overlap. In our times, we also have the problem of the widespread acceptance of relativism, the, in quotes, my truth regime, close quotes, which if accepted would make each of us potentially a legal system unto ourselves, which is antithetical to the very concept of a society. There is also the argument that law does not require force as it forms part of a social contract. All that law requires to be true is consent in the form of that social contract. Certainly, most laws and regulations and rules are obeyed by consent, whether or not the citizen is aware of the rule or not. Certainly, most laws and regulations and rules are obeyed, whether or not the citizen is aware of the rule or not. He may stop at the stop line in his car out of habit, as it is a prudent thing to do, without knowing he is actually obeying a law. Most thinkers today would say Rousseau's social contract is a fiction, but then the same thinkers turn around and tell you that the true basis of consent is democracy in the form of universal suffrage and majority rule within a mass democracy. This, they say, is the essence of legitimacy and consent. This makes little sense either, in fact, given that there is no requirement that a voter be informed about current affairs, and his vote may be, well, is manipulated by the media and government propaganda, his vote may simply be harvested and uh, what about voter fraud? Heard about that? Another method of democracy, the direct kind, is the referendum, in which the powers that be control the framing of the question and can repeat the vote until it gets the result it wants. This is what occurred in Quebec, although they in fact didn't get the result they want. I suppose they can always have another. There is no way of knowing whether the voter even gave the question a moment's thought. The problem with consent to law by democracy is that this is as much a fiction as a social contract. Consent in the last few U.S. elections has also been expressly rejected by millions who voted for the losing side with the line often heard, and I quote, not my president. If there's no express consent, there's certainly no implied consent. Consent, whatever fiction you are using, does not in fact eliminate the need for force. It just tries to relegate it to the sidelines as a form of incidental procedure, not in any way essential to a legal system. Up until fairly recently, international law was regarded as the classic example of generally accepted rules amid civilized societies, but which had little or no way of being effectively or at least universally enforced. That may have been true post-World War II and during the Cold War, if we only consider enforcement action under Chapter 7 of the Charter of the United Nations. A veto at the Security Council by a permanent member can block, and often did block, substantive resolutions. Today we can see this is a very narrow view of enforcement of international or globalist norms. When the legal route to enforcement is lacking, countries or international organizations have just danced around it, as the U.S. did in Iraq and Afghanistan, and as NATO did in its bombing of Serbia and Kosovo. Supporters of these actions argued that although these enforcement actions were technically illegal, they were legitimate because they were obviously just and moral in their essence, to the core, on some kind of objective standard. We will see this again, and we'll see it in the future, 
on issues like climate change or COVID-19 responses. Where something new and apparently urgent arises, global powers behave as if the technicalities of the law do not apply to them and they can act as they please on their moral authority alone. We see this also in the blatant and shameless hypocrisy of taking 500 private jets to a climate change conference where the assembled elite consume beef and chicken and cream sauce. We see much more than tentative moves to create what has been called a new world order managed by a technocratic elite with disciples occupying positions in power on the national level and willing to use national enforcement mechanisms to impose international or globalist rules and policies. We also see the widespread use of economic and political sanctions to enforce so-called international or globalist norms. As the head of the EU, Ursula von der Leyen, has said, troublesome nations that flout EU directives don't concern her, as she has many tools at her disposal to enforce her rules. The same is true for all global public and private policymakers, who increasingly act entirely in unison, without opposition, on the rules they want enforced, and seem more than able to get them imposed on subject nations by all means necessary. Nonetheless, whether at the national or international level, a seamless system of rules enforced by sanctions still does not exist and may never exist. The question whether a law requires a sanction is more nuanced. To quote Lloyd, law like morality is a flexible conception. Using Weber's terminology, law as an ideal type may require coercion as a feature, and yet there may be situations where coercion is lacking or where the tools of enforcement are missing, such as a defunded police force. I will suggest that due to advances in psychology and behavioral sciences, as well as the underlying progress of the surveillance state, increasingly coercion finds itself subsumed under the veneer of consent. With that merging, the more brutal forms of coercion are often no longer required, and the lesser forms of coercion operate without citizens being aware they are being nudged. Other developments are a product of technology. In a surveillance state, where our every move outside the home may be observed by fixed or mobile recording devices, and where we may be monitored and listened to even in our own homes through our precious devices, compliance is more easily obtained without resort to expensive policing. Likewise, studies now show how humans can be divided into various personality types or classes, some more or less susceptible to simple modes of persuasion. For example, most of the population, apparently, falls into a category called joiners, who only need to know that everyone else is doing something or thinking something to comply. Perhaps four out of five people are, in fact, joiners. Which knowledge, in the hands of the state, has made it relatively easy to produce mononarratives, to quote Morgoth, on almost all policy issues, be it climate change, the war in Ukraine, gender, LGBTQ issues, the sanctity of pharmaceuticals, equity and inclusion, responses to crime, migration, abortion, euthanasia, and gun control. In a place like Canada, only one narrative on any of these policies is acceptable, all others being unsafe, dangerous, antisocial, illegal, if not demonstrations of mental illness requiring treatment. Other personality types, like the academic, who needs to know how you got to the conclusion you reached, the skeptic, who queries every step you've taken with a lot of suspicion, the bottom-liner, who just needs to know the answer, or the controller, who won't accept any decision unless it comes from him. These are all far less common types and can simply be overwhelmed by the level of conformity around them or isolated and destroyed. Aristotle may have considered man a political animal, but modern science and the evidence of our senses are persuasive that man is by no means purely rational. When he attempts to rule by reason, he has produced a reign of terror or the killing fields. Man is also ruled by unconscious forces, many of them aggressive and impediments to communal living that need to be controlled. That's not particularly controversial. But before the technocratic state, 
that control may have had to be overt and violent, like public executions, to set an example. De Mestre has said that the structure of civil society is founded on the hangman. But coercion in the modern state is far more intimate, given advances in technology and the passive consumers that mass societies and the grinding weight and tedium of modern life seem to produce. The modern state is a quick study and is learning other ways to control without appearing to do so. It can track our every move, and a hateful word at the dinner table can, by law, now land you in jail. In Paul Gottfried's After Liberalism, he introduces us to the concept of the therapeutic state, in which the state pathologizes dissent, or in other words, treats political opposition or unacceptable points of view as a medical rather than a legal or political problem. Failing to conform requires intervention to help the sick person and protect society from contagion. The effect, wonderfully enough, is to coerce without anyone knowing it. Quoting from Parvini's Populist Delusion at page 135, it is important to grasp here the salient feature of Gottfried's analysis which is not merely to say that the managerial state has developed and adopted this ideology and these tools of mass manipulation to justify its own power, but also that it has developed them as a political weapon. Quoting from Gottfried, The political class has adopted inclusiveness and diversity as a political instrument, as means of controlling a society it is set about reshaping. The diversity machine is a mechanism of state power that operates without anyone being permitted to notice its coercive nature. Therapeutic regimes are packaged in a way that disguises their resort to force. Although Parvini and Gottfried are analyzing power, the application to the understanding of law is obvious and again points to law being downstream of culture. With coercion implemented as a preliminary matter to create the mono-narrative, the implementation of laws to address whatever mono-narrative policy conformity has already been coerced is a straightforward matter. Much like no-fly lists, digital IDs, and property seizures, characteristic of the Canadian total state, a properly groomed population accepts the loss of the right to movement and nullification of its property or, for example, unlimited abortion, which is a total loss of rights to the fetus, as if such laws had always existed, as if such restrictions are self-evident, obvious, plain, and logical, without being aware that they are conforming to the mononarrative that was implanted or to which they have joined. In the technocratic-bureaucratic state, coercion is more and more in the background. In the impersonal charismatic state, which I discussed in episode 3, authority may well smother the need for force at all, much like legitimacy supplanted legality in international law. The invisible hero health expert, the nurse, or soothing voice on the government phone information line has unquestioned even unquestionable authority and is the embodiment of the good and the moral. The fact that the charismatic state wills it is sufficient coercion to the joiners. And where force is required, the mothering state is apt to say that this punishment is going to hurt it far more than it hurts you, dear. A Trudeau or Ardern are masterful prototypes of this type of hellish leadership. All the while we can assume the therapeutic state takes great sadistic pleasure in the treatment it provides. The therapeutic state also uses rhetorical devices to cloud the issue of coercion. For example, when implementing measures which are not coercive in name, the therapeutic state may make it so that failure to comply will cost you your job, your reputation, the right to practice your profession, your ability to move about freely and engage in commerce. In such cases, the therapeutic state may well insist that there is no coercion being applied at all, that it is providing information, doing its best to help you, but you have only yourself to blame, that your suffering is a reflection of your ongoing right to choose, 
and your pain comes from your foolish decision not to comply. A few final points. Coercion is not just the extreme measures of detention, arrest, fines, and imprisonment. Coercion also includes all the procedural aspects of the law. Standing in line for hours to get a passport, or filling in countless repetitive forms and applications, or apps to allow you to enter your own country, are merely forms of coercion of a lesser type. The command theory of law, expounded by John Austin, and which I'll deal with in some future episode, held that law is the command of the sovereign backed by a threat of sanction in the event of non-compliance. This is echoed, I think, in the common law saying that there is no right without a remedy. But laws do exist without specific sanctions, and there are duties and directives which are, in every sense, rules or laws, but to which there is no obvious sanction attached. For example, many laws contain a definition section, usually at the beginning. In this section, terms, words, and phrases that occur later in the legislation are defined. Those definitions are critical to the functioning of the legislation that follows, and yet there is no specific penalty if you choose to ignore that a motor vehicle, in quotes, does not include a, in quotes, golf cart. And if the police choose to stand down while you are beaten at a protest, or choose not to arrest a person who has robbed you or stolen your bike. And where this policy is the exception that makes the rule, no one would question that assault or theft are still crimes, that they remain laws. But the law in this case, rather than being enforced by the appearance of the storm god, exists in a state of entropy and decay. The modern technocratic state in such cases is showing a particular predilection for the ugly, for chaos when it suits it, and anarchy when you happen to be politically out of favor. It is to the same effect when you hear for the first time from the judge that the rights you thought you had by a plain reading of the law do not in fact exist and never did.